restore the Snyderverse. Yes, now that we have it, naturally the next question is if and when we're going to get more of it. And that's what I'm going to answer in this uh, video. I'm going to give you both the business uh, answer and the creative answer based on what's uh, uh, hinted at, you know, very, very, very evocatively in the Snyder Cut itself. Cul-de-sac, my butt. <laughs> All right, so anyway. So as Zack Snyder recently revealed, one of the main reasons AT&T and Warner Brothers greenlit the Snyder Cut was the presentation by Zack Snyder and his agency. After that fateful day, remember I told you if, the, if you were ever going to tweet, that was the day? Well, they took all that data and they compared that social media chatter to Netflix social media chatter for their shows. And it was quite favorable. Remember at that point, DC, uh, I mean, uh, Disney Plus uh, shows, DC on the brain. But at that point, Disney Plus uh, Star Wars, you know, just Star Wars at that point were only beginning to launch. And I would say it wasn't, in, you know, until I'd say this past year. And I also, I wonder how much the pandemic factors into this because so many people, you know, people aren't as, as mobile. It'll be curious to see uh, how everything transitions out of the pandemic. Uh, a day that will, I promise you, eventually come. But anyway, HBO Max said, we like those numbers. And sure enough, upon launch, the Snyder Cut delivered. You delivered, I think is more accurate. HBO Max crashed in Asia. And uh, the Snyder Cut has been trending globally all day long. It's a global phenomenon. If only HBO Max were a global service. It's getting there. Uh, I mean, its competitors are global. And, it, you know, it is going to get there. And thankfully, the Snyder Cut was made available on other platforms, you know, where HBO has deals. At least HBO is a global platform, so they didn't have to build these relationships or branches out of scratch, from scratch. But anyway, it's really important that the Snyder Cut is trended all day because even Disney Plus shows usually, usually only trend until I'd say about late morning. And then they surge again, maybe, you know, sometimes if it's a really good episode in the evening when the next round of people watch it. You know, there's the people who are hardcore and watch it right away. The Snyder Cut also is four hours, which creates a little bit of a different situation. Although a lot of people did watch it when it dropped. But then, you know, everybody, there are other people who save it for the evening. Uh, Snyder Cut was in the top 10 all day long, except for a brief period where, to be fair, it did drop to like number 11, but it didn't totally drop off the map, and that's really impressive. So this means that for the very first time, HBO Max, AT&T, and Warner Brothers still struggling streaming service, let's be honest, has been able to make the kind of impact, uh, this kind of impact, since it launched a year ago. It's the first time they've been able to do it. Uh, now, we don't yet know how many people tuned in. Uh, we might never know that number, but we, I think, and what's the actual important number anyway is how many, what were the new subscribers? What was the subscriber jump? Uh, I think this is far enough away from uh, Godzilla versus Kong that it would be distinct, but I don't know. I think a lot, some of that animosity is fading away because everybody's in a good mood when you have a hit. And so I don't know if it's going to, you know, I don't think they would, I think that Warner Brothers will look at this as the one two punch that they should look at it as. Uh, but anyway, the subscriber ju uh, jump, but then also clearly we can see that Zack Snyder's Justice League has finally enabled HBO Max to compete at the level of Disney Plus and Netflix, the two clear front runners. It's not even close right now in the lucrative world of streaming, because as I always tell you, make no mistake, that's what this is all about. Hollywood loves to make money. Why did everybody start a streaming service? Not so they could entertain you at home in the, in the you know, at your comfort and convenience and give you more content. They did it because Netflix was making just so much money. So they said, we'd like to make ridiculous amounts of money. And you know, so far only Disney has been able to duplicate the Netflix model. Although with the Snyder Cut, it looks like HBO Max might be onto something. And the HBO just is, in general, hasn't had something this hot since Game of Thrones. They can't even bring Game of Thrones back. You know, um, you know they're trying. They're really trying. Uh, but you know, this is, it's hard to get something. You know, pitch shows are valuable for a reason. Uh, so you might be like, this isn't a show. Well, we're going to discuss that now. Not only is this valuable in terms of subscribers to HBO Max, but it's also valuable in merchandise, although nobody merchandises like Disney. Netflix, for some reason, has like no merchandise, basically. But then also, company strength. AT&T complicates the situation because, you know, Disney has no parent company. Disney, it, it, you know, its stock only focuses on the things that you associate with Disney. But AT&T's stock price is not only dependent on how uh, Warner Brothers is uh, performing, uh, Warner Media and the 
then Warner Brothers is a division within that, but also how AT&T is performing as a telecommunications company. So it's like really difficult. But if that telecommunications company were to have a streaming service that generated almost, um, you know, like hundreds of millions of dollars a month, which is what streaming can do, uh, that would be very good for their stock price. So that's why it's so valuable. And sure enough, as I've recently been telling you, uh, AT&T and even Warner Brothers execs, because again, everyone likes to make money, everyone likes to be associated with the success. They're suddenly more open to continuing the Snyderverse. And that was before launch, right before launch. And so they're probably even more interested now. We'll see how the weekend goes. We'll be covering this, I think, for at least a little bit, if not hopefully a long time. So first, as I said, I'm going to discuss the business side of what could happen next, and then I'll discuss the creative side based on the actual story seeds that are planted in Zack Snyder's Justice League, and even in some degree, Batman v Superman, because, well, we'll talk about it. All right, so anyway, we're going to do business first. Now, because they're on display down in Dallas, uh, but that's fantastic. Um, you're not supposed to take pictures of them. There's actually a plaque up next to the storyboards that says, please don't take pictures of these, which I think is hilarious. I'd love that someone would go and be like, damn it, that stupid plaque, I was going to take a picture. But don't do it. Listen to the rules at the Discovery District for AT&T. But you can go and see them in person. They're beautiful, 12 gorgeous big storyboards. But they're officially out there. Zack Snyder's plan for his Justice League saga is is out in the world the bell has been rung as uh, as you know as so many people like to say even jason keel or no i think warner brothers some official warner brothers account even tweeted that today which i thought was very funny it's funny very funny don't take too much stock though from social media uh, accounts because they're run from by people who are much lower down than the decision makers so they might be having fun but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're reflecting what the upper management is thinking all right so anyway Contracts kept Zack Snyder's Justice League from being released as episodes. So the basic idea, as has been reported in a few places at this point, is that everybody was signed for a movie deal. And so if suddenly it were to become a TV show, all the contracts would have to be re renegotiated. And now that everybody knew what a hot project it was, everybody's management would be very aggressive. And you had some very big names here. So they were like, you know what, let's just not go down this path because it's just a, a can of worms. Let's just keep it as a four hour movie, which, you know, I was talking to somebody about this. I think it actually works in the Snyder Cut's favor because it's quarantine and it's like a challenge. Everyone's like, can I sit and watch a four hour movie? You know, it's a little bit like how A Quiet Place, the first movie benefited uh, from the challenge of can everybody stay quiet in the multiplex? Because we'll hear you if you make a sound because this is a very quiet movie. And that was very beneficial. So I think that it actually was fun. I think it makes it feel like more like an event. You're like, do I have enough snacks? When am I going to take a break? Let's get ready. I think that's really great. But anyway, I'm hearing that going forward, AT&T and Warner Brothers are liking the Snyderverse as a flagship series for HBO Max rather than more movies. I have some plans here that would maybe involve a mix of that, but that's where they're leaning. Now, I'm also hearing still that they would like Zack Snyder to fix Wonder Woman, but maybe not direct Wonder Woman 3. I feel, you know, after I tweeted that, I did, you know, some of the people I talked to saw that and it factored into their conversations, your response. So, you know, they keep an eye on Twitter these days. And the idea was that, you know, maybe it would be a PR disaster to have him take over. You know, the optics would be bad for him to take over for a woman. But maybe they could do something where they worked on it together somehow. But just, you know, for maybe him to have a stronger level of involvement. And also, even though Patty Jenkins is, you know, pub, you know, officially signed on for, to Wonder Woman 3, She's very busy. She has other commitments. And I think there's a way for some other woman to come in and direct Wonder Woman 3 and for Patty Jenkins to still save face. I think that that Wonder Woman 3 is still very much in flux because Wonder Woman 1984, you know, Patty Jenkins said, trust me, it didn't work. And so I think that, that you know, it's very difficult to move forward after that. Uh, I'm sure they'll find a way, but it's going to take some, some finesse. All right, so there's also the option of a Joker project with Jared Leto. I told you that that was a very strong chance. Uh, that could be a movie, by the way, uh, you know, a theatrical release. And that would take place, what I'm hearing, in a regular setting. It would not be a nightmare s setting story. I hear Leto is extremely enthusiastic about that option, and so that's a very strong choice. Uh, although, again, the real value of the Snyderverse is to propping up HBO Max, which needs a hit. Why would they take it off the service where it's really thriving and where the service that needs, a, you know, the, the division of uh, Warner Media that really needs a lot of help? 
Now, as for continuing the Snyderverse itself, restoring the Snyderverse, one of you was like, please say that in your video. So I've said it a bunch of times. But you can, we can all see that Zack Snyder likes to tell very long stories. And as we've seen from countless recent streaming hits, six to seven episodes can work great. It doesn't have to be 10 or 13. And by the way, six or seven would be a lot more than you even got here. So that would be a lot more story. And I think you'd be very pleased with that. Plus these days, big streaming shows have the same size budgets as movies. And Zack Snyder does a lot of his shooting with green screens and then brings in his top-notch VFX team. That's very practical for a streaming show budget-wise. I mean, it's no make no mistake, it's still expensive, but you know, it's very doable. Also, the Mandalorian has made significant progress in bringing down the budget even more while still doing something that looks really big budget. And for instance, I also heard that Zack Snyder is already dabbling with that stagecraft technology, which he could do a lot with. I mean, I think you ain't seen nothing for what stagecraft can do until Zack Snyder gets his hands on it. And I'm also hearing that Warner Brothers execs like the idea that with the series, Zack Snyder could cover a lot of characters and that it wouldn't require too big of a time commitment with any major actors. That's very valuable to a studio. Now you might be like, I don't care. I want the actors I want for as long as I want them. But here's how a studio executive looks at it. Oh, well, I have to only book an actor for less amount of time. So that increases the likelihood that someone would commit to my show because they only have to show up for less time and then they can go do something else. So it broadens the scope of who you can get for the show. Also, they're cheaper because I, I don't have to pay them for as many days. So it's really, really likable. So you have a lot of guest star opportunities. And that worked very well for The Mandalorian, by the way. Timothy Oliphant's like, hey, one episode and I'm out. And it also provides great chatter. Uh, I think it's fantastic. And fans, who wouldn't love to see Zack Snyder's version of a ton of DC characters? It would be fantastic. After all, Warner Brothers is pushing the multiverse hardcore these days, so why couldn't the Snyderverse continue to play out on HBO Max in a very sprawling and aggressive manner? Oh, sounds great. And maybe even after a season or two, if it's really, really successful, it continues, because it is, if it continues to be very successful, it could jump back to the big screen. You know, you could be like what Marvel's doing with the small and the big screen, you know, weaving back and forth, telling the same story. Uh, we'll talk about that a little more in the creative section. But then, of course, there's the cyborg in the room, Ray Fisher, who needed to prove himself here as much as Zack Snyder did, and I think they both scored touchdowns. Oh, I changed the metaphor to match the movie. I don't believe that uh, Walter Hamada will ever step down, and I don't think he will ever be asked to step down. I've heard from several people that I know within Warner Brothers that while Hamada's call to Ray Fisher was unfortunate, Hamada was not involved at all with the making of Justice League and what happened with Whedon, Joss Whedon and Jeff Johns at the time. He was running the horror division. Even though there might be some friction there, and I think that a lot of the people currently working on the Snyder Cut have been upset about Walter Hamada's, you know, resistance to it, let's say. Uh, but I think that comes out of Hamada's loyalty to the, some, to the people who are still left over from the old Warner Brothers regime. Walter Hamada himself, these people begrudgingly admit, not begrudgingly, they admit. They're like, yeah, but to be fair, Walter Hamada had absolutely nothing to do with the things that happened with Joss Whedon and Jeff Johns. It was just that phone call, which was very serious. But I think that if it's just a phone call, I would hope that there will be a way for Fisher and Hamada to find a way past it. Because Fisher's cyborg is just such a great character, and I would hate to see audiences deprived of seeing his adventures continue. And to lose cyborg, not only is a great superhero character, character, but as a role model for that representation in this genre. The character is so good, I feel he has that level of potential. Hollywood has been fumbling with characters of color, and it's important, I think, to really support and bolster the ones that they undeniably get right and, you know, and, and actually improve upon. I think this is the best version of Cyborg I've ever seen. I could even see Cyborg maybe getting his own HBO Max series. You know, maybe he can't go quite back to the Flash, to, you know, be in the movies and be in Flash. But I think he'd really, really take very well to an HBO, HBO Max series since there's a human interest element to it, with the way he uses his powers and that, uh, with that, uh, with that single mom. And I think he could help out a different person every week, you know, every episode. I mean, it makes it a little bit, you know, like uh, network television-y that have to be careful about that, but I think it could be really compelling.
Okay, on that note, let's talk creative. All right, so if you've read Zack Snyder's Justice League Saga storyboards, uh, this is only the second part of a much bigger story. Now, these storyboards, you're like, why aren't we going over them, Grace? Well, that's because these storyboards, I'm telling you the bits of information that are pertinent in my videos. But these storyboards are only partially relevant still because a lot has changed since they were written. But they still hold clues to Zack Snyder's intention. I don't believe he'll ever tell that story at this point. Maybe he will. But I think, I, I think that's, and I think that's why he shared it. He he has said that he has other storyboards, um, you know, talking with me that he doesn't. He's not ready to share just yet. So I think that he shared these to give you, because I think you can, if you can just tell from this movie that there's just such a large scope and the through lines are going from not just throughout the film but to movie to movie. And so it's you know it's it's important I think to know about this stuff. But anyway, I think that there will be changes going forward if we move forward because things have, have been changed. Now, when Cyborg is about to jumpstart the mother box in Superman's ship, Superman's ship warns him that this action is irreversible and will bring about a specific future. And sure enough, he has a vision of what that future is. I love that he whispers no and Flash hears it as go. I thought that was great. Whoops. You know, take the comms down, uh, you know, the comm link. But anyway, Cyborg's vision foretells of the mother box sink, mother box's sinking, which it does before Flash turns back time, Superman and Doctor Strange style. And the Earth, and, and but in this vision, Flash isn't successful, and the Earth is remade in the image of Apocalypse. Dark Side rules and takes out the big guns right away, as a boss would do. He outright kills Wonder Woman. You can actually see him watching over her funeral at the, in this shot. Uh, and Aquaman, he also kills him uh, using uh, his own trident, and then he kills somebody else with Omega Beams. Those were so cool to see. Some of you have asked why he didn't just use his Omega Beams when they opened up the boom tube at the end of the movie and he was just standing there. But I mean, why isn't Dark Side old? Maybe it takes a lot out of him. I don't know. Maybe he'd just be Omega Beaming everybody. It would just be constant. You know, I mean, who could fight him? He would just be using Omega Beams all the time. Um, and now I've seen so many dark side stories and I actually don't even know the answer to why he's just, just constantly Omega Beam people. Just like, boop, boop, boop. Why are we even having these discussions? Um, I thought maybe they could tie it to the anti-life formula and he doesn't get the Omega Beams until he unlocks that. But that I don't really think that makes any sense. But it's a, it's a problem. It's an interesting conundrum. They sure look cool, though. And then speaking of Omega Beams, he Omega Beams the crap out of Lois. He fries Lois Lane and her unborn child which drives Superman over the edge, and he becomes Darkseid's enforcer. Wow, he's like, I have nothing left to live for. And everyone else on Earth is like, well, we do. And he's like, don't care. <laughs> I'm gonna join Darkseid. And he even kills a Green Lantern, as you can see here. They're always just on the edges of the Snyderverse. Uh, and this also draws significant inspiration from the Injustice storyline, where Joker kills Lois Lane and drives Superman over the edge. Now, also in the comics, both Superman and Supergirl have been momentarily turned to the dark side. <laughs> I love that it's also, you know, it's, it's, you know, obviously, I believe before Star Wars, right? But, you know, dark side and dark side is very funny to me. All right, so anyway, it's a little franchise humor. So this leads to the nightmare world first teased in Batman v Superman, where parademons look a lot more like Tim Burton designed them, which means things have gotten real bad. <laughs> and Batman has assembled a ragtag group of who's left, which means both heroes and villains. Now there's a reference, Mira talks about Aquaman being dead, which we've now seen. Uh, and then also there's a reference, Batman talks about how Harley Quinn died in his arms. Uh, and Flash, by the way, is wearing the same suit he does in the Batman v Superman time travel bit. That's because Batman and company in this scene, if you read the storyboards, you would know this. So I think that helped a little bit actually watching the movie. They're trying to get to the cosmic treadmill, which Cyborg will operate and then put Flash on and he'll go warn Batman as he, so they get to it. So I guess Superman in that scene is not successful because they do get to it or maybe some of them die and then, you know, at least Flash and Cyborg get through. Um, I guess Flash should just pick up Cyborg and get out of there, leave everybody else behind. I'll be like, just get all those Supermans as fast as him, as this, as uh, this uh, the, uh, Justice League so hilariously uh, highlights. Uh, but they get on the cosmic treadmill and they warn Bruce that Lois is the key. And what that means is, is that Bruce needs to sacrifice himself to be Omega beamed 
instead of Lois, because that way Superman doesn't go to the dark side. Uh, and that's the theme of self-sacrifice that I talked to you about in my spoiler review, that Justice League is all about self-sacrifice, and that's why Joker says, how many multiverses are you going to ruin just because you're not willing to step up to the plate? Uh, and he eventually, so Batman does. It's great. Very good arc. Again, it's very good arc across three movies. Joker, though, is a new wrinkle, not in the original Justice League storyboard. So that's just, an, that's just one example of how they have changed dramatically with just one addition. Uh, but Zack Snyder wanted to make sure that fans, at the very least, you know, on the chance that this doesn't continue, would get at least one Batman Joker scene in, this, in his world. Uh, and, he, and Zack Snyder certainly delivers on that count. Joker and Batman having to team up in an apocalyptic future has been done before in the comics, in fact, recently. And it's a very interesting idea. And I think they'd perfectly, you know, I think they captured it actually the best here. I think Zack Snyder has done the best job capturing the fact that Joker and Batman are might be adversaries, but they're also peers, which is why I think they do this dance. Um, and I think they're probably the only two people in the world who will be honest with the other one. And they aren't worried about making them angry or hurting their feelings. And so... That to some degree makes both of them valuable to the other one, which also would be an interesting idea as to why neither one is willing to kill the other. I like that. Very good stuff. Uh, if you know if, this, if HBO Max is interested, we could have a very serious dramatic play. You know, it's, you know, just a, a nightmare Batman and Joker hashing it out, and I think a heck of a lot of people would watch that. I think they, maybe they could even do that. That would be certainly a, you know an inexpensive way to move forward, and I would just love that. That would be just so great. But anyway, also I think I would love to know how Joker could survive with no powers in this uh, nightmare world. I mean, what kind of deals has he had to make? He's a pretty scrappy guy, right? Who's clearly willing to do anything. So if Zack Snyder continues the story as he has now changed it, I think Joker is, a, is definitely a welcome addition to this team. And I would love to see Wonder Woman eventually show up. I got this idea while I was doing my spoiler review. And because this isn't in Zack Snyder's original outline, but it's in many Greek mythology stories that the underworld, Kingdom of Hades, can be escaped. It is not permanent. And it certainly took care to a demigod like Wonder Woman. And I think it will be great to see Wonder Woman's journey out of hell. Contrasted, I love this part, with Batman and company's journey through hell on earth. She's in real hell or Greek mythology hell and they're on uh, dark side's hell on earth. I think that's fantastic. And then they come together over the course of the movie or series. I mean, a, a parallel, parallel storylines like that, contrasting them, comparing and contrasting them would work really well in a miniseries. Then, of course, Zack Snyder could also continue the current timeline because he doesn't have to jump to the nightmare future. That's always just kind of waiting there. But Martian Manhunter, of course, reveals himself to Bruce Wayne and tells him there's a war coming. I love that Bruce is like, okay, whatever, man, another alien. Great. I'm glad you're not an enemy. I'm going to go back to sleep. I'll see you later. <laughs> that was great. But also, at the end of the movie, they set up that the new Justice League headquarters are going to be made, they're going to be built in the ruins of Wayne Manor, which I think is lovely. Although, Again, that's, I guess that's why everybody knows that Bruce Wayne is Batman. I'm like, oh, this is very clearly your old family house. He's like, I could have sold it to you. <laughs> All right, but anyway, a big table with, he says, a big table with six chairs. And then Diana says, and room for more. Oh, so a Zack Snyder Justice League movie uh, or series, you know, could explore the more, right? With again, a round of guest stars, much like the Justice League animated series did in its later seasons, which ended up using its large roster to have a different uh, a different uh, assortment of leaguers every episode. And it was very entertaining. So I think that would work. I think that Zack Snyder could produce that HBO Max show if he does not, was not interested in doing a television show uh, about the secondary leaguers. And then when they get a really big problem that, are, that they need one of the original six for, that would be a movie that Zack Snyder himself could direct. And again, as I said, much like Marvel is moving back and forth between the big and small screen with their studio and streaming service. So that's where Restore the Snyderverse currently stands right now just after the bell has been rung, just like Superman's cry. We can still hear it ringing in our ears. So we'll see how far those sound waves get. Pretty far! They just have to get basically Jason Keylor. <laughs> I think he's heard them. All right, so share your thoughts down below. Subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.